Hello, this is Hunting Fields by Dr. Peter Cola, narrated by the Hooded Vigilante. Chapter seven, Girls of the Corn. In the dark art of spiritual warfare, a death hunt like any spiritual attack can only be performed once like a trump card in the hand of a great card game. If overcome, can never be played again. Woe to those who cast spells against targets that have already overcome, for, the, for a fate worse than death awaits them. Dr. Paul stands at the corner of his treatment office looking at a schedule of all the people that are coming in while contemplating the few that are still sitting in the back one exercising, one waiting patiently as he decides what procedure might help her the most with the issues she has irrit irritation with today, one having little to do with the original issue she came in with, the strained neck. Your new eval has just arrived, his assistant says, as he hands me the papers, and he reads a young boy of seven suffering from Williams syndrome. While I vaguely remember it from school, I certainly had no idea what physical issues or especially how to treat a genetic condition, especially since I do remember in school, they can constantly press the fact that in the case of genetic disorders, as well as terminal illnesses, there was nothing that could be done. So better not to even try. In walks a beautiful and regal mother, followed by her small child, walking along the ground as his bent hands and legs like a monkey, his face exceptionally small, almost elf-like. As the mother explains, that's why they call this condition elephant's face syndrome. Then breaks down crying as she obviously sees my confusion and doubt on my face, wondering to myself, what could I possibly do for this kid? She starts also to relate that the majority of these children hardly participate in school, especially physically, and they die early in their adulthood, usually at the age of 25. I try to pre appease the woman and promise to at least try, assuring her maybe we can help with the boy's arms and legs by stretching them or helping him with some hand movements. The problem is it will take a long time and I already know the insurance company will not approve treatment of a genetic disorder. Chronic issues that will not get better are, are hard enough lately to get approved with steadily fewer and fewer visits regarding, regardless of the individual's information given, and they certainly won't approve for genetic issues longer than a couple of weeks. I could try to get them to approve a few, but it will be a few at the most. She says, I will... I will pay no matter how long it takes, as long as you are willing to try. I'm already so I'm already so frustrated with the controlling nature of the insurance companies. Well, I think if you just pay the, the co-pays each time $20, we can live with that, especially on an ongoing basis. But again, I'm only willing to do it if you commit to six months, two times a week minimum. The boy, the woman breaks in tears with an immediate laugh and approving smile as she hugs me in thanks. I then turn to the little boy, Lucas, who already was wandering a few steps into the office, picking up an exercise stick and swinging it over his head in wide-eyed child's play and hitting a small table of accessories, sending them all spilling and crashing across the floor. The little boy stands there shocked, looking back at the two of us. Paul just raises his eyebrows to the shocked, smiling mother. Don't worry, I say. That's exactly how this exercise is designed to be performed. They both bust out in laughter as the boy looks back at the stick again, or maybe another swing. Children will be rambunctious when people live in the rural communities of the Midwest, United States, like Wisconsin. The wide open spaces, farmers, cornfields, berry patches, and unexplored barns, unexplored barns are the perfect playgrounds for, for kids, especially when they have more trouble making tendencies 
preferring to swing the farmer's axe that he laid casually in the barn in the barn tool shed than just pet or feed the horse that is currently staring at them inquisitively as the four boys make their way into the closed barn. The farmer is quiet, and be that it is the middle of the summer, kids are just are off of school, always the same four boys on these exploration missions. A seven-year-old Paul and his younger brother Anthony, nearly two years younger than, than the lanky Paul, yet already almost as big as the other boys, not to mention Chunky. <clears throat> My best friend, Mark, and Tim, another chubby boy from down the street. Most people would say these kids are like the three musketeers, but Anthony usually only gets to come along when Paul's mother makes him bring him. The kid cries all the time at the slightest nudge. And since he still wets his pants as well as his bed, usually daily, it's hard not to pick on him. On more than one occasion, they would just leave him behind as they tracked through the countryside, seeking treasure or adventure, as was the case today. The old farmer's barn was a scary place, regardless of the treasures found there. Even the older kids had to admit darker shadows that seemed to linger just beyond the piles of discarded farm equipment, chains, ropes, boxes, cutting tools, always just lingering out of the earshot. Mark said the old man, von Schlachten's, name really means butcher his father being dutch used to speak a little at to him this might explain all the butcher tools and chains hanging around the old barn mark's older brother claimed that the kids actually found an old german luger in a box filled with old war clothes in the barn on one of his on one of his own previous visits to the barn, he had this had the, had enough sense to leave the, it behind, but could help take couldn't help take a, back a couple of the crossed medals off the old jacket of the old box. The box was now gone, but hard to tell with all the piles of junk stacked everywhere. Mark said. His brother claimed that a few times the older kids heard screams coming from the barn. This was usually enough to keep any of the local kids away, but not the three musketeers. One of the boys, unnoticed by the rest, was swinging an axe and suddenly broke a hanging lantern and shattering, ear shattering crash ushered in an immediate escape from the barn as the old man's cursing in his foreign language could be heard from the main house even 30 yards away. This set off a mad scamper and further crashing noises as the alarm to, to the head to the corn was immediate, if not spoken, at least by some of the already running laughing boys. Anthony is usually left standing, already crying in terror, beginning his own self-imposed flood of piss water erupting from the, his oversized jeans, all, now already running down his leg. This time, Paul mercifully, mercifully grabs his brother's hand and literally tugs him, the now bawling five-year-old, out the back door in, into a full sprint towards the corn. The farmer hobbles out of the shadows of the dark side of the main house. All, all the fleeing boys could see was the dark shape with a severe limp in the north-shadowed face of the late morning sun directly behind the house. The old man does have a couple of older sons, but luckily they have not been around for a while. And recently, and the recent stroke impairing not only his run, but his ability to manipulate the rake swinging in his good hand. The old farmer tried to run a few steps with his left for every one of his right across the grass from the house. You sons of bitching kids, you're lucky I, I don't have my gun, the old man says along with a few other choice words that the kids could hardly understand, such as cut for dama and something like blue trinken. His hobbling on one foot made him so slow the kids didn't even have to run fast. Mark even slowed to laugh as the other kids entered the, root, the corn, limping like the, far, the farmer as he made sport of the old man's affliction, putting a couple of crippled hand gestures 
and a dooey dooey dooey. The same noises that often they would often tease that a boy by the name of Stebbles, one of Anthony's friends up the street, boy happened to have, be afflicted with Down syndrome. The cornfield that surrounded the area they knew like the back of their hands as it was so easy to get turned around, especially for kids, maybe four and a half feet tall at the most. But not these boys, they laid so many trails through the corn. Every particular stalk became familiar. The corn by, by this time of year was well over their heads and so thick a person could hardly see through the next row. Paul walked past many times when he would walk to school, but it was a bit out of his way and a long, and long, but he always enjoyed the walks. In those cases, he stayed well away from the corn, but especially the old farmer's farm. This corn field directly adjacent to Von Schlachten belonged to Hoffman. And while he didn't like the kids playing in it any more than Schlachten did, he seemed to hate the old man even more and often would even encourage the kids to play in the field even during planting, allowing them to play in the old discarded tractor equipment stored in the, at the dump in the middle of the field. On one and more snowy winter, Hoffman would pile up all the snow in the middle of the field with, with his tractor making a huge hill. The kids would sled down or the perfect place to have snowball fights between the mound and the dump. Hoffman seemed to love to just sit in his wooden chair under the old apple tree in the corner of the field and watch the kids play. Occasionally, old man Schlockton would be standing with them, but they never bothered the children or even said anything to them. And when they played there, apparently they did like each other some of the time. His brother Anthony Mark and many of the other neighbor children, even a few of the girls, plus many of the younger friends seemed to want to play in the dump, oftentimes for hours even days in a row, but that place always gave Paul the creeps. So he couldn't stay there more than a few minutes at a time and certainly never alone. All the children were warned about not playing in the old refrigerators that sat face down with their doors wide open, but that didn't stop them from playing anyway, or the discarded tractors or old trucks or huge piles of boxes and rusty tin cans or discarded farm machineries of unknown use. Why not? None of them wor worked anyway. Later that same afternoon, Paul went out looking for his brother. His mother had yelled at him to find him from in the house. So he started his trek down the street. Anthony, come home for dinner. Paul yells out as he calls to him from the, from the end of the street. A strange buzzing sound in my ears, and the stars started appearing in my eyes as I walked. Paul, I'm in here. Help me, I'm lost. Anthony's voice calls eerily from the corn. From the shadows of the corn, eyes peer back at the boy as he casually meanders up along a gravel road, a sinister wisp rasps his way out between the lips of the old man as he just starts to move closer to the vantage point as the path narrows closer to the bushes under the old apple tree just ahead of the boy. This one will do nicely, the old man halfway thinks, yet in an almost predatory animalistic way as it just senses the right combination of qualities it knows will satisfy the desires of the experiments that drive it. He reaches in his dark cloak and pulls out a weather talisman amulet in the form of ball and starts to caress it. Paul is walking through the corn, still looking for his brother for dinner when his mother ordered him to go and get him from the, at the dump. The boy had a tendency to daydream even as he walked along for a simple task like looking for his brother this could be the annoying quality to have since often he was accused not paying attention in school, having no idea what the teacher 
said even moments after she spoke something right in front of him. The creature moves through the shadows with remarkable stealth, considering this his obvious limp and impairment. The circle of which is performing a ceremony is not his concern. It is his interest in watching the boy approaching, the reason he surveys his surroundings. Nobody at all around, nothing in sight that would bring up any alarm to the ceremony and more importantly, the hunt of the boy, even if he managed to get out of sound during the taking. He painfully swallowed two of his red of his own red pills and one blue. As he begins to speak whispered words of an ancient and Germanic language, words so archaic he hardly knows the exact meaning, yet feels the power they bring. As Paul slows and comes through the long, thick rows of stalks at the edge of the corn and starts to see hearing girls singing ahead, peering now from a row or two back from the edge of the corn to the dump in the middle, he is bewildered to see the group of girls all dressed in white, barefooted and standing in a circle, swaying as they hum a strange song and wave their hands above their heads. They are all young, but definitely older than Paul, maybe 10 or 11, and on up. Some look like high school age. One was Mark's older sister, Samantha. And while she was probably only 12, to Paul, she already looked like a woman. Paul liked her, especially when Mark would ask him to spend a night, and she would want to play with the younger boys. Samantha always liked to play the Ouija board, but she would want to play hide-and-go-seek as well. On more than one occasion, the boys were already in the bedroom. The boys would look out of Mark's dark bedroom door and see Samantha showering and dressing half naked in front of the mirror. The door cracked open, and she always smiled as she glared back at the dark door. She couldn't possibly see us both watching her. The large, muscular creature moved slowly so as to not alert the child, staring out from the corn at the coven, the coven, almost like a shadow gliding from the bush to bush, the old muscles and sinew of the, of the aged man's body suddenly brought to life in a dark rippled muscles that have more, that have been dormant now for perhaps decades. Even among the low-lying corn leaves and dark shadowed barbed wire fences, of the field, his presence is hidden from view by the many trees that line the farms from the road and houses in the distance. He has watched the boy walk by many times on his young strolls through the countryside. Normally he wouldn't touch any candidate so close to his home base lab, but this one has a light surrounding him. He has never seen and is worth any risk. The larger, and younger appearing man says from the shadow softly to himself. Paul moves closer through the long grasses that edge the corn as he crawls hidden behind one of the tractors and wiggles up on his belly under the under it, weaving through the grass. The girls sway as they dance in a circle. And to this boy, there, is, there was something extremely enticing about the way they do it. He wiggles even a little closer under the shadow of the tractor as the girls move past him close enough for him almost to touch. The now setting sun through the bright red clouds shining through the, the, through the gowns cast an almost red glow on the bodies of the dancing girls as they sway before him. The rhythm of their humming matches the buzzing in his ears and he feels his body being pulled towards the center of the circle. The Royal Grand Master Warlock moves to a vantage point, a turn in the road near the approaching dump edge. He looks down the path to his own farm, providing a quick escape, the high stalks forming a wall. When running crouched down, will keep him just below the sight of anyone who comes by. The now more creature than a man, he feels the spirit of the talisman start to release as it invigorates his body into rage. Just past where the boy has crawled from the corn, within moments he will be under his grip. The creature squats, just preparing for his final sprint, holding the dark burlap sack ready to pounce. 
As he squats, he suddenly notices a light glow turn into a shimmering light around the boy. At first, just the softest of distortion of light surrounding him, yet with each moment, the intensity of light seems to increase, almost being, almost pulling the creature back, pushing it back in fear of being burnt by some unknown blaze. Paul's mind started swimming inside of him. The voice just gently nudges him, having him realize this isn't right. As he suddenly becomes embarrassed by his own strange feelings. God, I shouldn't be there. Help me, the boy says softly out, out loud as he hears a distant snap or pop in his head and a flash in his eyes with momentary stars like he just, like he just woke up from a dream. He looks suddenly at the, to the light of the edge of the field, realizing the sun was going down. A tingle in the back of his neck causes his hair to stand up to literally, to literally straight. He feels scared. A dark shadow starts covering the girls. Something, some of them even start looking older than the oldest grandmother of his nightmares. Even, even the ones he knows, instead of looking at girls with any kind of desire, he suddenly is frightened by them, even repulsed. The sheer weight of darkness now pressing it to flee. The light presses, to, presses the dark creature for a moment back into the ground, literally shoving the seasoned German officer into the ground. Its own desire to flee with his, with his realization of the absurdity of him being afraid of this small boy merely because he seems to have light emulating from him seems absurd. The remaining sanity of his own mind holds desperately to the fixed ground, knowing, suddenly fearing, he underestimated the power such a child might possess. It certainly was not enough to sway his desire for the boy any more than the many has captured before, both boys and girls throughout the many years now since they came from the fatherland who crossed his path. His physical will chooses to overcome the fear of the light as he springs into action just to see the boy has already begun to flee, fleeing himself. Paul starts crawling backward out of the grass almost as fast as most boys could run back towards the corn. He, he thought out of the corner of his eye he saw a large black shadow descend onto the edge of the circle near the old apple tree as his hair on the back of his, of his whole body suddenly stood up straight. Time to go. He wasn't going to wait. He jumped up so fast, spun around out from behind the tractor and ran into the corn without even a sound except the thrashing of corn. It felt like his feet didn't even touch the ground. But as fast as he sped through the corn, the more he was sure they or something was following him and gaining on him. Paul was always faster than the rest of the kids, often leaving trouble faster than he got himself into it. At the expense of the other boys who often departed even before the fire was started or the door was broken into, yet in, in short time, Paul was passing the others, running quickly past frightened, frightened children like they were standing still. This time, the faster he sped up, the louder and closer the darker pursuer seemed to close in. Its screaming animal voice was only barely audible under the thunder of, the, of his thrashing through the corn. The creature speeds as he runs on all fours, tearing the ground. The old man looks up in hate as he sees his own, his own animal claws closing in on the child, running with incredible speed and blazing in light when he had never seen let alone imagined. The clawed arm before him reaches up and stretches in anger closer to the neck of the sprinting boy. Just as the boy sped in front of the gaining creature, again the grip of the ready to grip the child with its sh shadowed talons, a bright flash seemed to emanate from around the boy like a barrier of pure bright energy, pushing even faster away. Any case, any chance, the boy, the old man might realize to grab him 
even if he was able to outstretch the arm that earlier was paralyzed, which wasn't even a claw any longer. But now again, his own shriveled, paralyzed hand. The old man again um, almost sees for a moment the, the face of a bright blue angelic spirit erupting out of the light. He's terrified and more so the dark spirit inside him immediately turns back within him, screaming silently to flee. Man can feel the white hot blast push him away even as fast as he starts to, to spring and tighten his final grip of the claw around the child's neck. He is also just as hard toppled into the corn. The, erupt the erupting spirit blasts from his chest as the child shoots through the outer edge of the stalks. Paul thought desperately to himself, almost out, just as I begin to see the houses jutting over the tops of the final stalks to the edge of the corn. Only a few more rows. I don't dare turn my head to see how close the creature is now. He could almost feel its breath behind his neck and knew it was reaching out with a clawed hand to try trying to grab him by the neck before he escaped. Any slowing, any glance back, even in fear, and it was assured to be caught. A flash of an electric pulse of lightning-like light sends the old man now floundering to, to the ground into a crevasse that moments before was not there. Only rose from the edge of the corn. The old man tumbles into the grasses near the edge of what he feels is surely a grave in an almost semi-conscious silent heap to the ground gripping his heart. Gasping for air, he chokes, gasps of breath as, as if they were his last. He settles still in pain. The blue and white light fades from his view as his own eyes close to the darkness of the grounds around him. And just when Paul thought he could see the talent clawed, claws encircled around his neck, he burst through the last row of corn into the open dirt road that surround the field. With such speed, a few chunks of corn were dislodged and flung onto the road with leaves still attached. As he sped right through the dirt road past the weed hedges that lighted it onto his friend Tim's grass, he literally tumbled from the speed and rode at least two or three times around in the grass just to land back on his breaking feet and hands, turning and looking to see who or what was following him. Nothing. Paul stares, heart racing, yet he hardly takes a couple of deep breaths as his breathing returns to normal. Just the stillness of the corn and the slow filling up of the dark and shadowed gap he had just made as he ran through it. An angry skeet screech in the distance like a screaming eagle had the boy glance up suddenly into the distance at the sound. Now crouched on all four like a hunting dog, Paul stared back at the corn, panting desperately, not as much to catch his breath, but to calm himself down from the fright that filled his every being. What are you doing? The chubby Tim says from the comfort of his porch, feeding himself something from an oversized bowl, sitting in his parents' rock, wooden rocker that watches comfortably next to the front door. Looking for my brother, Paul says, barely panting. He never really ever needs to catch his breath after running as he gazes back at the now dark cornfield that lurked before him. Why would you go in there this late in the day? It's already almost dark, Tim said, now stopping his munching, still having Captain Crunch cereal clearly dropping from his mouth. You didn't go back to the dump, did you? You know, you don't want to go back there after dark or anywhere near that time. My mother told me to go get him. He was at the dump, Paul says, as he just now begins to awake Again, take his eyes off the black recesses of the corn. What was I thinking? And now that I think about it, I don't remember her ever even saying that at all. Only just walking through the store stalks, hearing my brother's voice up ahead. Your brother? I saw him with that Stebbles kid. 
climbing around in the dirt piles of the curb and gutter before. They were playing King of the Hill, he says as he remembers with a laugh. One moment he's wrestling with a few of the kids at the top. I think Julie from up the street, she always wears those dresses. Now the laugh was replaced with a boy smirk. And before you know it, your brother is at the bottom of the hill crying so loud, I, I could hear your mother yelling at him to shut up from inside the house. More laughter from the boys. That was over an hour ago. When did you go into the cornfield? I've been here the whole time. Paul's just stood there now with a confused look on his face, trying to remember if he, if he even walked in the cornfield from, from this direction at all. He went inside to change his pants. I think he peed them again, Tim says to Paul, snaps out of his stare and looks back at him. Both boys laugh as Paul looks at the large piles in front of his house that lined up like a ridge on the street, marking the ongoing building of a huge sewer pipes under the road in front of their homes. The larger, the young, boys get, young boy gets up and brushes off his pants, contemplating now a new hole in his knee where he, his, where he must have busted through as he rolled in the grass. He rips out his pants almost every time he runs fast, no matter how loose or strong the jeans his mother buys. My mom's going to get pissed, he says as he heads for his home. The young, heavy set boy can only nod as he agrees with Paul's assessment. Every pair Paul owns, he busts out his knees. Nobody seems to have that problem. Paul hears a noise behind him and glances back down the path to see an extremely old man limping away. He might look like old man Schlockton, especially with the limp, but this man is much older looking and skinny as a skeleton. Neither boy bothers to look back at the now dark wall that was at the edge of the corn, only to see a large dark figure now standing in the shadows of the corn staring at them. It seemed to materialize out of the shadow where Paul only moments before exited, clawed hands and goat feet, along with its horn goat-like head, the massive black wings almost enveloped into a shadow of the corn. The only other colors other than the shades of its black is the red in its eyes, blood red. Suddenly appearing around him, also stepping out of the dark, is all the white-clad, half-dressed, small young women emerging from the deep shadows, who also stand just inside the recesses of corn, their blank stares and, almost, and black, almost hollow eyes are not expressing interest or longing but are fixed on the single thought that mimics the beast in their midst, pure hatred for the boy that got away. It is important to establish an environment that not only places the prey at ease, but is so void of danger, their children feel safe enough to venture from the watchful eyes of the parents. But under no circumstances, can ever any formal hunting or harvesting of prey be done within even the remotest proximity of these outposts or risk the ultimate discovery and, 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 and intentional use will be discovered. That was chapter seven, Hunting Fields. I will be back tomorrow for chapter eight. Bless you.